uh, dear friends, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for coming to celebrate this very, very important partnership uh, with Kellogg School of Management. And this is pro this Guanghua Kellogg Executive MBA program is really a new milestone for a long-lasting relationship, friendship, and partnership. And we uh, launched this uh, program with the confidence of the two largest economies, the US economies and Chinese economies, will remain vibrant for the long run. And there's uh, probably little doubt at this point, I mean, very little uncertainty about the US economy. But somehow, I think there is a worldwide concern about the Chinese uh, economy at this point. So I would like to uh, spend a uh, little time on this particular topic, on Chinese, um, what's going on in Chinese economy? Will the Chinese economy remain vibrant? Now, this is a worldwide concern about Chinese economy finally landing, whether it's a hard landing or soft landing. And, it, and there are lots of press about you know, troubles the other major yeah, emerging economies are facing these days. And if you look at China, on number, China still looks strong in terms of GDP growth rate, but no one really takes serious about the GDP number anymore, the Chinese GDP number. Even if you look at the GDP number, it's going down for quite a while. And so the serious uh, concern is, is Chinese economy switching to another growth track where it's from the high growth to relatively low growth, let's say four or five percent. I mean, if this is happening now, this is a lot, it's a serious implications for China and for the world economy. So uh, that's the question I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to uh, uh, think about. Now, the, um, behind this concern, one of the major um, reasons for this concern is the, uh, it's this question, what's, go, what's wrong with the current China's growth model? If you look at the international uh, 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 comments, both the China skeptics, for example, Paul Krugman, he's written and is, he likes to, you know, Aside from his uh, you know, uh, comments on the U.S. economy, his, uh, uh, once in a while he writes about China. Now, he, uh, last year, he had this column on the New York Times which says that hitting China's wall. And the main concern is that the Chinese growth model has lost its balance. So you think of a car where the wheels are not balanced, and the car is driving on a high speed. So the end will be very hard crash. And he says the crash, the uh, unbalancedness is related to what's called the consumption ratio of the GDP, cons consumption investment ratio. So in conclusion, he says, the only question is how hard the, cr uh, the crash will be. And interestingly, for those people who are optimistic about China, they look at the same issue on China's growth model. The only difference is, whether this re, uh, balance is, out of, is totally out of control or China is regaining the balance. So for example, Stephen Raj uh, said he's one of the most vocal China optimists. He says that the will of rebalancing are turning, meaning that China are regaining control, are doing the rebalancing, is not gonna crash but they are looking at the same issue. The Chinese growth model is unbalanced. We need to rebalance this. And this idea has become so influential, this actually become the official Chinese government's policy. It's written in the 12th five-year plan. So what I want to argue is that this so-called rebalancing is the wrong idea. It's, it's, it's basically misled by the mysterious Chinese statistics. Now, if you look at the consumption, if you look at the com components of China's GDP number, you look at the consumption, the consumption, I think it's vastly underestimated. 
For example, if you look at housing consumption, which is very major part of the U.S. household consumption, it actually is uh, roughly 20% of the U.S. household consumption. And this is uh, uh, almost 14% of U.S. GDP. Now in China, this number is only 8% of household consumption and only 3% of GDP. Now the difference is that it's the way of the Chinese statistics about uh, household consumption versus the U.S. So for the, um, the major difference is the dispute, uh, so it's what's called the, uh, a calculated imputed rent of ho home ownership. For all the Chinese urban citizens, home ownership is 80%. And with the high rising, it's the fast rising housing prices and, ho and fast rising rents. If you do the imputed rents, the household, uh, housing consumption will be pretty large components of China's GDP number. But in China, what's been done is actually calculate the imputed rents on the historical uh, co housing cost. So this alone, I think, makes at least 5% difference on the consumption number. Now, if you look at the other things, for example, service sector. The service sector has always been, in one of the criticism of Chinese growth model is that service sector is, uh, is too, too small. If you compare to the US, even compared to India, China's service sector only accounts for 47% of the GDP, 45% of GDP. Now, what are the reasons? If you've been China long enough, whenever people say we have a too small service sector, I always try to think what's missing? on the service, I don't see what's really missing. So if you look at the statistic, what's the difference? I think the difference is that how we calculate the healthcare expenditure. In the US, this is almost 18% of GDP. I'm not saying this is right, but from a statistical point of view, China's healthcare expenditure is only 5%. The difference is very much related to the healthcare expenditure, for, for example, for us to go to the hospital, the, uh, what you pay is very little. But the real consumption is there, and it's not calculated in the, in the statistics. And then we have a very, I mean, our economy is largely cash-based. The millions of housework, uh, house workers in China, their services are not counted. Not alone the legal, in legal, all sorts of the, uh, the uh, service industries that we see in China's daily life. And there's another, uh, and, uh, another reason for the underestimate of the uh, service sector can be shown in the 2000, uh, 20, uh, 2006 census. The National Statistics Bureau did this census afterwards. The up revised China's GDP number by 16%. Most of this is under reporting of service sector. So if you take into account the underestimation of the service sector, this will be at least a few percent of the GDP. And there are other reasons that, uh, there are other reasons of the underestimation of the uh, GDP number. Uh, for example, the uh, accounting practice in China makes lots of the ho uh, um, uh, household consumption not as a consumption, but as part of the operating cost. The recent anti-corruption uh, anti -cor 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 campaign in China makes a lot of the public spending, stopped a lot of public spending. And this has a serious consequence on lots of the uh, um, uh, industries or sectors in China. And those public consumption actually are uh, hidden household consumption, but those are not counted in the consumption data. They are counted as the operating expenses of the governments of the SOE. And even if you look at the private firms, we have a study looking at the entertainment and travel costs of Chinese firms, and this number, in terms of ratio of sales, is at least twice as large of the uh, South Korea. So that means lots of uh, 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 consumption expenditures are counted not as consumption but as uh, uh, firm expenses. And so there are other, many other um, channels where consumption data are seriously underestimated. On the other hand, the investment data are seriously overreported. If you add all the GDP numbers from all the provinces, 
at least you have a few trillion Chinese yuan above the national total. Where does this, this uh, tr uh, few trillion dollars, uh, yuan come from? It's mostly come from double, account, double counting. And double counting cannot be on consumption. It has to be investment. Investment by large firm, headquartered in Beijing, there are plants in, uh, let's say, Sichuan. So it will be counted once in Sichuan and once in Beijing. So these are a few trillion dollars, a few trillion yuan. And then they are uh, underestimation of depreciation, and there's also underestimation of the price defeated. There's a, a paper on JPE by Alvin Young in 2003, basically studies the underreporting of the uh, price defeated for investment goods in China. So there are at least a few percent of GDP of overestimation of, of investment. Now you add up the underestimation of the consumption data and overestimation of the investment data. This so-called rebalancing, loss of balancing, becomes pretty much disappeared. I think to say the very conservative estimation is that the investment GDP ratio of China will be less than 40%. And this is the, basically the main problem all sorts of commentators point to the China's growth model. There is another additional so-called um, argument, which is, uh, which is that even if we, we agree that the investment GDP ratio is below 40%, it's still too high compared to the US because the US is only 17%. But this argument is also false in the sense that we have a period of uh, other countries with very high investment GDP ratio, like Korea, like Japan, in their high growth periods. And also, if you look at any point across countries, there's a huge variation in terms of investment ratio. And if you really take economic theory uh, uh, seriously, there's no standard economic theory about what's the optimal uniform investment ratio. So this is sort of like this cartoon says, where this guy has the perfect height, except that he's 11 feet short. You're re really using one measure for a standard, for international standard here. So take this, the whole point of the statistic uh, uh, miscalculation, this, this wrong perception about what's the optimal investment ratio, and Together, this means rebalancing is not really a major problem China faces. But this idea leads to very wrong policy, uh, policy implications. Basically, based on the rebalancing idea, it's suggested and also become official policy, which is we want to encourage consumption, consumer society we want to disencourage saving because saving was too high. And then um, we want to encourage service, and then we want to disencourage manufacturing. We want to encourage consumption, and then we want to disencourage investment. I think this is a very dangerous because if you look at the, um, uh, the, the Chinese history and then the history, the, the uh, economic growth of other countries, I think it's um, artificially pumping up consumption. It's equally or even more dangerous than artificially pumping up investment, overinvestment. And this can be seen from the Asian financial crisis, and this can be seen from the recent financial crisis by the US subprime uh, crisis. So, and the other thing is that if we follow through the policy implications of this uh, idea of rebalancing, Basically, we want to sort of have a premature stop of the industrialization for China. I think this is also very uh, dangerous because you look at any major uh, economies in their process of modernization, no country can skip the steps of industrialization and then jump to a uh, high income country. So, uh, so then the question is if rebalancing is not an issue, what will drive China's growth in the future? I think what's gonna drive China's growth in the future, we want, it's not investment, quantity of investment matters. It's whether, it's not whether in terms of quantity, investment is too large or too small, it's really the quality. And so for to improve the quality of the investment, 
we want to have a high hurdle and more accountable for public investments to guarantee that public investments are indeed efficient and effective. And also we want to have tighter regulation enforcement on the environment protection so that we do have a sustainable growth. And then the other thing is that we really want to encourage more private uh, sector investment. And also we want to emphasize focus on investment that can create real jobs. If you look at this graph, this is a graph where we have the uh, the relationship between the uh, private, the ratio of private investment as a total investment and the China's GDP growth. What you can see from here is these two, uh, um, these two lines as, uh, are highly correlated. What this means is that this we are not looking at the total level of private investment. We are looking at the ratio of private investment. As the ratio of private investments are higher then we have a, a better growth. So that means the private sector investments are the key to uh, driving the uh, high quality investment. This another figure is the uh, growth, the relationship of growth and job, uh, job creation. I mean, Chinese statistics are notorious for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for transparency, but the most, uh, one of the most uh, notorious Chinese uh, uh, statistic is on the jobs and the da uh, jo uh, data on jobs. So, but, but still you can dig out some useful information. What I did here is the, the right line is the growth, num uh, the growth rate. And this line is what I construct as the number of new jobs, number of new formal jobs. In the Chinese statistics book, there's a job, there's a, a category of uh, 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 what's the factor this is, is uh, self-employment. But the self-employment number is very, in China, uh, in Chinese statistics, it's very in a gray area. So add up the total new creation, uh, creation of new jobs, you pretty much have a constant number. And that means the Chinese unemployment rate it's always constant at 4.5%. Uh, but if you take out the self-employment number, then what you have is creation of new formal jobs. And for the new formal jobs, you can clearly see that in some of the years, this, they, are, um, they are very high, almost 20 million. In some other years, it's even below 5 million. Each year at this point, China has between 50 million to 20 million young people entering the job, uh, job market. So if you only create 5 million formal jobs, that's not enough. And that also shows the recent years, the so-called growth of 7%, uh, 8% are not at least high quality growth. So what this means is that we want to focus on investment that can really create formal jobs. So, one, so this is one of the drivers for China's uh, future growth. Another driver for the China's growth is on organic consumption growth. You can't artificially pump up consumption. But there are some other consumption growth uh, areas for consumption growth. One area is more babies. The Chinese uh, family planning uh, policy has been, uh, in, uh, has been effective for more than 30 years, and this is the time to stop that policy. Because the China total fertility rate, by the official statistics, statistics is only 1.5. In the urban area, it's 1.1. In the rural area, it's 1.8. Many people argue the real reality is even much lower. And the replacement level is 2.2. That means a couple uh, give birth to 2.2 uh, two children in order to maintain the total population as a stationary level. We are seriously below that level. And that means disasters in the future for the Chinese population and for the Chinese people. And so in the long run and in the short run, it's very important, it's crucial for us, for the Chinese government, to stop this family planning policy 
and very soon we need to encourage people to have more baby. In the short run, if they do that, if the government does this, it will generate very healthy organic consumption growth. Just imagine we have three million new babies uh, more each year. It's at least going to generate more than 300 billion Chinese yuan. And this is uh, sustainable because each year you have three million to, uh, let's say, three million to five million babies. Then this gets accumulated over the long run. So more babies is one area for organic consumption growth. And the other is better children, better children, better quality, better health, better education for children, especially in rural area. And lots of studies in China shows that the investment are spending on, the, uh, on education and health for children have a very high returns. And the studies in, uh, by uh, the uh, Lu Mai and other people on, uh, in rural area, even about the lunch program in these schools have a huge effect on these children's health, school performance, and the future job prospect. So this is an area for, um, uh, for more spending. Now this is from investment and from uh, consumption. There are also important drivers for China's growth from what's called efficiency enhancement and the productivity growth. And at least there are two, uh, two things that can work for uh, China's growth. One is what's called reform dividends. I think if the market reform plan announced last year can be successfully implemented, this will generate substantial efficiency gain, and this will fuel China's growth for years to come. And the other thing is about innovation and in, uh, knowledge. I think this is the area why Guanghua Kellogg Executive MBA program can contribute to, uh, uh, to the knowledge creation, to the innovation capacity of Chinese firms. And so um, with this, I want to uh, conclude. Basically, I think I want to argue that rebalancing is the wrong idea. And you will not put the Chinese economy on the so-called red track. Instead, I think it's dangerous, uh, dangerous enough to actually derail the growth of the Chinese economy. So I'm actually cautiously optimistic about the growth prospect of the Chinese economy. I think the Chinese economy can still grow strongly if we can improve investment quality, if we can generate organic consumption growth, and if we can implement, we can focus on efficiency, uh, efficiency enhancements and productivity growth. So that's why I think back to the theme of this event, we are celebrating this great partnership. We're very confident this joint EMBA program will set new standard for EMBA education in China and in the world. And I really want to thank the discre uh, distinguished speakers, distinguished guests, alumni for joining us uh, in t uh, tonight's celebration. And I also want to thank our great partners, led by Dean Sally, Sally Blount, and uh, her, her team, her people. Paul, Jennifer, Linda, Amanda for flying all the way from Chicago to China, to Beijing, for organizing this wonderful event. And I want to thank all the faculty and staff from both schools who have worked tirelessly on this joint program. Thank you very much. Thank you.